We always see amazing pictures on the internet of faraway galaxies all around us, galaxies that are light years away. But despite that, we can take clear photos of them. Also, despite it being a hard but possible thing to do, as long as we have telescopes that can see for that far of a distance, everything is clear so far. The problem arises when we find a photo of the Milky Way galaxy from the outside. We're already inside. How are we able to take photos of it from the outside then? Welcome. This is Midnight Thoughts. And in this episode, we'll answer the question, how did we capture our galaxy from the outside when we're inside it? Before we begin, if you're still new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe and turn on post notifications so our videos reach you first. It's the red button below. Do me a favor and subscribe. Imagine that you're standing in a football stadium. You have a phone with a decent camera, and someone has asked you to take a clear photo of that stadium from the outside. But this photo should include the entire stadium from start to finish. What are you going to do? Simply put, the answer is that you'll leave that stadium, get yourself far away from it, and take the photo. This is the method we all use when taking photos of large structures. But can we apply the same principle if we want to take a picture of our galaxy, the whole Milky Way? Well, let's see what machine humans were able to send for the furthest possible distance in space and see if that distance is enough for us to take photos of the galaxy from the outside or not. In 1977, NASA launched Voyager 1, a space probe that visited Jupiter and Saturn. It sent us photos of them and information about them. After that, it continued its journey till it reached the Kuiper Belt and completely got outside the borders of the solar system. It'll keep traveling in space until the year 2036 when its atomic battery gets depleted. Here, we're going to ask a question. Where would the space probe Voyager 1 have reached after all of those years? After 45 years, Voyager 1 was able to travel 23 billion kilometers. It seems like a scary number at first, but is this enough distance for us to take photos of the galaxy from the outside? Let's see. The Milky Way has a width of 100,000 light years, to say the least. In order for us to compare this number with the distance Voyager 1 traveled in kilometers, we will have to unify the unit of measurement and convert the light year to kilometers. One light year is equivalent to about 9.5 trillion kilometers, and that is 9, 5, followed by 11 zeros. It's a big number on your screen. With a simple calculation, we'll find out that the 23 billion kilometers Voyager 1 traveled in its march from 1977 until now represent a little over 21 light hours. This means that for it to be able to travel one light year in distance, it will take it 18,771 years, which will be the year 20,793. And this is for only one light year. Keep in mind that our galaxy's width is 100,000 light years. This all means that we can't take photos of our galaxy from the outside by any means. Then how is NASA able to show photos of the galaxy? This means that NASA is officially fraudulent, right? Actually, no. What we just mentioned means that we can't capture photos of our galaxy using traditional methods like taking our distance from the galaxy and capturing a photo from afar. If anyone says that this is how it was done, for sure they're fraudulent. But this doesn't mean that there isn't another way that allows us to take a photo outside of our galaxy from the inside. Remember the stadium example we talked about earlier? What if we let someone stand inside the stadium, we took away the phone and gave them a professional camera, and asked them to take a photo of the stadium? But this time, we're not going to tire you out and have to get outside the stadium. You're going to take a photo from your place normally. But using image segmentation, it's by standing in place and beginning to take a photo of every spot that's around you in the stadium separately. A photo of the goalpost, a photo of the right side stance, a photo of the left side stance, and a photo of the other goalpost are taken everywhere around you. You take photos of them from your position. And then you take all those photos and add them together, just like we do with puzzles. 
Then you'll find that you have an ambient photo of the place around you, as if someone took it from the outside, but not with the same accuracy. This is exactly what astronomers did when they took photos of the galaxy. This wasn't invented by NASA or anything. A lot of scientists throughout the eras are who started this way of thinking. Modern space agencies came after them and continued their work due to the availability of tools and technology. A long time ago, people in old civilizations noticed a strange thing that appeared in the sky in specific months, and then disappeared. That thing was a giant long arm that divided the sky from the center, and inside of it there were large gatherings of colors. At the time, they didn't understand exactly what it was. By the way, we can still see this arm today if we're in a desert or somewhere very dark and without a telescope, like the Whale Valley in the Fayum Governorate of Egypt. People before used to log these sightings in the places of the stars, and perhaps one of the most famous old archives that demonstrates the star maps and their locations is Almagest by Claudius Ptolemy, who lived in Egypt his entire life, in Alexandria to be exact. Despite the fact that his visualizations weren't entirely correct, his model was very beneficial, and his maps remained a reference for astronomers for hundreds of years. A long time passed until we reached the calendar year 829, when the al Shamasiya Observatory in Baghdad was established by the Umayyad dynasty. It is considered the first astronomical observatory in Islamic civilization. The Muslim scientists began to adjust the Greek astronomical books and add more to them, like Abu Rayyan al-Biruni, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, Ibn Sina, and others. During this period, Muslims discovered a huge number of stars and divided them into groups, and the sky's map began to become more and more clear. By the way, a lot of stars still hold their Arabic names, like Sahali, Aldebaran, and others. Years go by and we reach the Renaissance era the period between the 14th and 17th century CE, when the astronomers in Europe began to measure the star locations in the planetarium and precisely log their locations, especially after Galileo's telescope upgrade. The first European to try to draw a full picture of the galaxy was the German-British astronomer Frederick William Herschel. Herschel divided the sky into more than one part and took separate shots using the telescope from more than 600 locations on Earth. When he added all of the data together in the year 1785, he concluded that this was the shape of our galaxy, and it's still known today by the name Herschel's map. After a hundred years of Herschel's trials, the Dutch astronomer Jacobus Captain made a similar experiment, but in a more advanced way especially with his measurement plan, which included the apparent size, class type, and radiation speed of the stars at 200 different locations. At the time, he'd collaborated with 40 observatories. In the end, he reached this figure. Until the calendar year 1917, when the American astronomer Harlow Shapley made a study of the globular clusters and said that the previous studies were based on our solar system being at the center of the galaxy. But that's not true. Our solar system is at the edges of the galaxy. Therefore, all of these maps need to be adjusted. During almost the same period in 1920, one of the most famous astronomers by far, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, began to study space using his own telescope and came up with some very important results. That is, the universe around us has many galaxies, but these galaxies, for some reason, are only limited to three main forms. The first form is the elliptical. Here the galaxy is basically a giant circle where the stars are distributed in an almost regular and homogeneous order. The second type is the spiral galaxy. This type of galaxy consists of a part in the middle called the heart of the galaxy which is a circular or oval shape that has most of the galaxy's mass and has a high number of clustered stars. Around the heart of the galaxy, there are a number of arms that wrap around it. The size and number of these arms vary from galaxy to galaxy. The spiral galaxies are the most common galaxies in the universe. The third form is irregular galaxies. They're considered the least detected galaxies so far. Here the astronomers said, remember the weird arm we used to see in the desert and didn't know what it was? This arm really looks similar to the arms that come out of the hearts of the spiral galaxies, and if our galaxy were spherical or elliptical, we wouldn't have seen this huge cluster of stars in one line. 
From here, the astronomers began to prove this hypothesis. In 2003, the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched, a telescope that collects infrared radiation and measures its wavelengths. Through Spitzer, we were able to make sure that the center of our galaxy is a bulge of red stars that has branches coming out of it, and that is the spiral arms. There is controversy about those arms, whether they're two or four, but through the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer that's called NEOWISE that NASA launched in 2009, we were able to know that there are two large spiral arms coming out of the center of the galaxy. They are the Norma and Perseus arms. The outer arm, Scutum Crux arm, and Carina Sagittarius arm are the three medium arms. A small arm branching out of the Carina Sagittarius arm, and that's the Orion Cygnus arm. This arm is where our solar system is located. Through all of the data that's been gathered throughout the hundreds of years, we finally reached the conclusion that this is the form of the Milky Way galaxy. And even that's not necessarily 100% accurate. That's it, we're done. Who stayed this far? To everyone still watching, you guys are the best. Give us a like before you leave so we know how many of you stayed till the end. And also, don't forget, if you have any question that comes across your mind in the middle of the night and keeps you wondering, put it in the comments down below the video so we can answer it. Most of the episodes we currently make are taken from the comments. Peace.